Um, as Sarni said, I have two other books. This is my third book. Um, a lot of people uh, Google me, and they think, oh, you're the farm girl. And they write me this email and say, can I come stay on your farm? I'm like, no, please no. I mean, I actually haven't been able to. I was never the farm girl. I grew up in Atherton. And um, I did, <laughs> OK, let's just be real. And I did what I could because my husband was uh, a chicken farmer and say, I wanted to eat the chickens. So he has to kill, or chicken, and he, want, he has to kill it for me. And then so I should be the one to clean it because, and I've never done it before. But that was sort of how I got into, and we were also kind of beat Nikki types in Atherton. So um, it was not so, so different um, approach wise. But um, <clears throat> I tried really hard on the farm, uh, helping out. He never sold vegetables. He was just for the family. Um, also, uh, he grows rice and wheat for the family. Um, and so, and we had three children, have a little home business. I was out of school. I was teaching cooking. And so I just did what I could as the, um, as the author turned girl who had not the strength of character as this farm husband of mine. Um, and time went along. Um, I was also trying to do a sort of edible schoolyard type thing. It's really difficult with three and four year olds because they run all over the field. They smash the little lettuce seedlings. But, you know, I did, and they <laughs> scatter the seeds like that. Um, but um, I just kept trying. And then um, I had wanted to write a cookbook. I was thinking I was going to write a cookbook about my food. Um, my husband was doing all the Japanese cooking. I did some. I've been cooking since I was a kid. Um, and um, I thought the easiest entree into publishing was, you know, through in Japan, because um, that's where my contacts were. And um, but I started taking online classes, classes at Stanford to get back my my writing. And um, people told me to start a blog, you know, and I kind of heard of this, and so I. My, one of my friends said, um, just check David Leibovitz's blog, which I did. And there was this blog camp, which I went to. And then David, um, David recommended, he said, if you're, he used me as an example. If you're living on an organic Japanese farm, then you should write a book about, about niche. You should write a book about the 100 best farm recipes. So I was like, OK. I was going to write that book after my little book. But I guess everybody wants the Japanese book. And in fact, <laughs> well, in fact, I, had I was collecting books um, because that was my, I'm always looking ahead very many years. Um, I already have the next few books mapped out. But um, I've never really seen a book that I wanted to cook from in Japanese cooking. Uh, I haven't, uh, I do have hair salad and things that the, I'm not saying, I, I didn't actually I haven't looked at his books, and he's probably a good example of somebody to, to go to. But um, there was a lot of women's cooking, and it was not merely appealing to me. Um, we don't, we drink um, wine or beer or sake with dinner, not tea. And so we weren't looking for the, I don't, wasn't looking for sweet foods or little, you know, stylized foods that you have to buy all these things at the supermarket from. And I just, this is not what we ate. And so I was always intending to write, and, and also, I like a more direct food, and so I was. I intended to write a book of my. I was gonna. I was like, on my 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 reunion pages for Stanford. I would say, I'm gonna write the book of this and this and this. When when Japanese men cook was the thing, and I do that to keep myself motivated. Like, okay, five years from now, I will have this book. But um, took a few few reunions before it actually materialized. But um, and I had another friend, uh, the soba guy. Soba chef guy. Uh, and I just loved their food so much. There were different foods. But in the end, I wrote a book about our food, uh, my husband's food, uh, Kanchan's food, um, and then my food. Because um, I was asked, I, I, I had never even made Nikujaga, frankly, which is a so standard dish. And I was like chasing my husband, Tadaki, Tadaki, how do you make Nikujaga? I said, OK. This much meat, and this many, this much onions, and glug 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 shoyu, and soy sauce, and some ginger, and simmer it for 15 minutes, and blah. Um, 
So I did, the, did it. I got all the, the mused up, all the stuff already. And then I used what I thought was the right amount and then measured it after how much had I actually used. And that became the recipe. And it was perfect the first time and better than his, <laughs> which we don't say in front of him. But, um, and he doesn't watch these, so no problem. <laughs> Though some of his friends do and report in. <laughs> it's really kind of bad. But um, so uh, that sort of started the, um, I became, um, I wrote more and more and more recipes. And the book, as in each project, the book, uh, each project, whether it's a book or it's a meal, it gels at some point, And then it's shoop, like that. So um, you approach it thinking, OK, I'm going to organize the book or the project like this. And then you, know, you don't want to step on it too much, because then you're, 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 you're messing with the creati creative part of it. And then finally, it just like, it makes sense. And then you can, you can actually you know, do the nuts and bolts of it. And that happened with each book. Um, I, I considered regionality for the first two books. Uh, up until, f you know, for the preserving book, I was really intending to separate it regional, regionally and seasonally. No, we're talking about seasonality. Forget the regionality. <laughs> so I considered seasonality for the first two books. And um, it became too difficult because like carrots are all year round, komatsuna is a green we use all year round. Um, and preserving it was made sense to be seasonally. But um, there's two, there's a the summer. And then there's winter, and then some of those vegetables go both ways, and so, you know, it just uh, it made much more sense that I wrote a book about where I organized it through the mediums, the preserving or pickling mediums, median mediums, and also by then I was visiting the uh, makers, and it was intended that I would I, I had a small budget for that from the publisher, it's a production budget I didn't have to pay back. Um, but then at the same time, I got, um, I was contacted by Fuji Television, and um, so they were, um, uh, it takes a, now I, I can ask for payment, but not very much, but um, basically with TV, you know, they think they're doing you a favor, so, you know, but they paid some of the expenses for the travel, and that was very helpful, and also it opens doors because, you know, um, you say, oh, I want to come visit you, and I want to find out all this information. And if it's for TV, they're like, yeah, sign me up. But if it's like a book that they'll see maybe three years from now, <laughs> you know, I mean, now I know them, and so it's fine. But um, there was some issues with, with this book. Like, the politicians were all excited. I have a friend in the prime minister's office. And he said, oh, all these guys in the, in the prefectural government, they, they got really excited when I told them about this book you're doing, Nancy. And, um, and so they, wanna, um, and, and they want to share their local recipes. And, I, and then when we really got down to the fact that, well, it's coming out in 2018, and this was in 2015, like, what? Well, they won't be in office anymore, so we'll forget that one. So, you know, okay. So it was really hard to, I tried to, I had to pay all the travel and uh, photography, which that's another story. Um, so I set up for this book. So that was my life. I wrote about our, our life, our friends. I also wanted to write about what I felt was the real Japan or the Japan I knew because people, love to tell these stories about how Japanese are so mysterious and, and so, you know, oh, there's all sorts of weird adjectives. But, um, you know, I mean, I just find, I mean, you can hug people, you can do whatever you want, and, you know, except for, like, there's some foreign things people do, like, I mean, the shoe thing, or I don't like to take big foreign men into antique shops because they <laughs> bang things around. But um, there's a little bit of... Um, there's, there's, um, there's a part of Japan that a lot of people don't quite understand, and that's the relationship issues. And, so, and that comes into play like with asking for things. There's an inherent responsibility about how you ask, what you give back. And also, like, if I, I've co occasionally been contacted by um, some like, filming people, and me introducing somebody to them 
there's a huge responsibility on my part as the introducer. Um, but otherwise, I mean, Japanese people-wise, we're all the same all over the world. We're just, you know, we have some other differences. So that's what I wanted to show. And also, frankly, I mean, some of the cookbook authors tell you, oh, every Japanese has every color on the table. It's white, it's black, it's green, it's red, you know, which is just bullshit. And I'm sorry, they don't. I mean, and they don't have sweet and sour and all these food, food tastes on the table every day. Everybody's just scrambling to get the food on the table. You know, most likely they're buying it at the supermarket or 7-Eleven, you know. Mm. Big way of life there. But um, so people are just trying their best. And cooking is down all over the world. We all know that. And Japanese government's super worried about it in Japan. Um, but the great thing about Japan is things change really quickly because of the, um, something happens in the media or something happens here. And then you can take a second look at their own country. And that's actually uh, the great thing of living in a small country because you know, the US is like this morass. You know, and it's like this frigate. How do, you, how do you move that frigate from its decided course? But, um, and actually I was just in Malibu at a, a pop-up I did, and this very famous surfer, who I don't know the name, um, said to me, he, he's Japanese, and he said, I give your Japanese farm food books to so many friends that when I want to say, this is Japanese food that I want, I mean, he also has a little, farm, a little gar organic garden. This is the food that I think is Japan Japanese food, and this is the way Japanese is, or Japan is. And so that was a huge compliment, actually. Um, and that was just recently. But then I wrote the preserving book. Um, a lot of it was research, uh, and also from friends, from uh, the makers, various so sources. And basically, I wanted it to be, I, it was six months late turning in because there was so much I found. And I felt like I'm not going to be writing another preserving book for you know, God knows when. And so this is my chance to put in methods that actually like I did once. I mean, if you could think about it. And so I put them in as methods, not recipes. And like, OK, fermentation geek, so you can just you know, give it a go and use your brains and, and, um, and work it out yourself. Um, but um, the, I mean, if you imagine a preserving book, there's, you, know, you get one chance at, at ume, the sour sour so-called plum, or um, there's really one small window for doing dry semi-dry daikon uh, and those type of pickles. And so it's like in December. Um, you can kind of fudge it, but um, you don't get a lot of chances at these. And especially it takes a few months for something to, to actually become the preserve it's supposed to be. And then, oops, you know, <laughs> and then what do you do? So it was a little bit panicky. But um, this book, um, I got asked to do it. Fiden uh, doesn't take um, pitches. They, they ask you. And it's part of a country series. If any, you guys are probably too young. But the Time Life series is a famous country series. I think they're trying to, to, to jump into that slot. It started out with these uh, very famous, a very famous uh, Italian cookbook that's in English, they translated it called The Silver Palette. It was a big, big seller in Italy and then a huge seller here. And then they did the same with a French one. And then they segued into um, asking an author in country. And then finally, they started naming it, blah, 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 the cookbook. And I think they're renaming some of the older books. And I was a little scared because I was just taking a little breather from a uh, sabbatical from my first, my first publisher, um, who now doesn't do my books anymore. So. I've moved on to another one. They have a new CEO, and they're trying to make money. So they're doing YA and some weird, some weird poetry that I know is really, I, I shouldn't even say it because it's, uh, um, I don't know anything about it. But um, I guess YA is big, and poetry, uh, something, you probably all know it because it's a big seller. And um, anyway. So I was very disciplined about this book. And um, I had uh, was signed the contract 2015 um, winter. So I had like um, two years to two and a half years to do it. Two years to do it. And um, 
I separated I separated the country out into, you know, I don't even have a watch either. Uh, hey Max, can you gra give me my phone? Thanks. Um, I separated the country out to places where I knew chefs, because, you know, you can pay somebody to cook for you. That's a concept, and um, that's the easiest way. That was the easiest entree, and the chefs know the local people and they know the artisans. And so I started to travel to these places. These photos are not in the book. We'll pick that up later. Um, I tried, started to travel these. My idea was I was going to go like two to three times and take this, the photographer this, the last time. And um, developing the relationship before bringing you know, the photographer um, and you know, I sh wished I could have gone more, but that's sort of the max on the, on uh, on my personal budget. Um, so um, I did find that again, without the camera, some of the people, like the fisherman ladies, actually didn't want to do the cooking thing for me again, and they had with the camera. Some other local ladies did, and then. Some of the ladies were like, oh, yeah. We have, they would sit around the table, we're drinking tea, and, and they'd be telling us about, they'd be telling me and the, the, the chef about all these local foods that they make. And oh, yeah, but they make them like a, a, at New Year or at Obon in the summer. And what am I going to say? Well, can I come next time and can you cook for me? You know, so it, um, but. Um, I was gathering material, and then I was photographing the chef's food and sort of organizing the book. Um, I had to make a decision not to pretty, pretty much not to do Hokkaido in Okinawa because they were off of Honshu, but I included Kyushu. And um, had a lot of material, but then um, my photographer quit. And I hired another guy, and Fiden didn't particularly like that guy for some reason. I don't know why. And so all these photos were out, and um, I repurposed them with another book, um, Food Artisans of Japan book for um, Hardy Grant in Australia. And I had to rethink, OK, um, how will I organize this book now without, there's no stories, no photos. There was like seven in the book. And the food photography was done in New York. And around that time, um, or before that, I had, um, before that, I had received, I was going to put a little section in the back of um, some of the, like, the Frenchy Japanese food, which is super cool, and, my, and um, the Italian -y Japanese uh, food, because a lot of the chefs I know aren't doing Jap Japanese food. They're, they're doing, um, oh, French and Italian. But it's not really French and Italian. It's like this, um, one of the guys said to me, you know, Nancy, the reason why uh, we can, we, this group of chefs are doing this, can do this food, why we have like this Italian or this French food is because we're approaching it through our Japanese culinary roots. And so we, we're bringing the techniques and the flavors into um, French and Italian food. And so that's what makes it, um, he's not going to say special, but that, well, I mean, for me, that's what makes it special. But I mean, maybe he's going to say that's what makes it unique. Um, but um, I mean, they're using dashi or things like these. There's a lot of clarity in Japanese food. And so if you think about it, I mean, frankly, I think that the food in some of the Japanese, uh, French and Italian food is, is better than what I've had in France and Italy. But um, anyway, I was going to put some shojin ryori in there, too, in the in the um, back section, um, and I know the Sen Nun, known her for years. And again, it was a situation of how do I ask her? And she lives in Okayama, which is near Kyoto, and I live near Tokyo, a couple, well, an hour on the bullet train. How do I ask her to cook for me? I mean, it's, it's a really hard thing to do, and you don't. I don't really know how what the situation is, and um, well, it turns out, and I, I saw her a few times. Um, and finally, the second time, uh, there was this ceremony at Meiji Jingu I, I go to every, every or every other year uh, where they cut down, the guy cuts down the, um, 
carp without touching it. Um, this massive knife. Looks like it can't cut anything, but I guess it must be like a katana. Um, and uh, the guy's 34th generation, uh, Shijo, I forget his first name, ex-rock drummer. And um, he's the head of this family, Shijo family, that is one of the protectors of Japanese cooking uh, cuisine. And they've got a street named after him in Kyoto, Shijo Dori. It's the one with a little river on it, really pretty. Anyway, um, so I approached her at that second one, and I asked her, I was kind of feeling her out about how to cook. She was, and she said, oh, I can do it any time. I can come to your house, or I come to, you could come. And so I uh, really pinned her down on it, and she wrote me this fax, because she was not super, I, I know she has a, phone, a smartphone, and she does send really short little emails, but, um, she sent me a fax, a long fax, explaining about the situation. She cooks at, uh, at two temples. She doesn't uh, live there. They're Zen um, because the the men priests are in residence, and they don't. They just eat Japanese food, and because they don't really have a big budget, they don't eat the greatest Japanese food, like the katsubushi is the little tiny packages and. Um, but she has a really beautiful feel with her food. And um, anyway, I, I was there. And then it turns out she cooked a whole shojin lunch for me, just for me, not even for her. And it's quite a big, it's temple food. And it's, there's just a whole pros proscribed um, uh, amount of dishes and, and placement. And, but she was kind of excited about the whole thing. And she wanted to, um, and, she, and I was planning to come back for each season. Um, in for planning for the future for a shojin dori book that I was will will be doing hopefully, and I brought the photographer once. But then, anyway, in that first trip, she gave me this book that she had written before she became a nun. It was called something kenko dori, some healthy cooking, and um, I uh, handed it. We didn't have that. We had her her temple food book, and I handed it to my. I'm a la very lazy Japanese reader writer, reader and writer. Um, and I handed it to my son, Andrew, who was in between jobs and just you know, doing this all day long, and <laughs> which is really irritating because I didn't grow up with that, and I hate it. And so I give him the book. And he's, he's got a good palate. He used to work for the Soba guy. And I gave him the book, and I said, Andrew, can you help me? Can you please do something? Because I also was feeding him. And his father was doing his laundry, not me. But, um, and I gave him a little stack of Post-its. And the book is like this big. I think there's 260 recipes in it. And I said, um, could you just mark anything that looks really delicious? And so eventually, I don't know how long it took him, um, I got the book back. And it had like 100 marks in it. And I was really excited. And so um, I sat down with my, uh, one of my ex-students. He was interning for me in the summer. And again, I cook for the students. And so they all. Um, they're all fairly food oriented, and um, I know his mom cooks too, and he's a local kid. He was in high school and on his way to university. And we sat down together because, like I said, I'm a lazy Japanese reader. And just went through, oh, also the beauty of this book, it had no, it had um, recipes, but not, I mean, just list up of ingredients, and then a, a really loose method. I mean, publishers now, they want to have how many minutes for every single thing, you know. Um, and uh, she would give like it should taste like um, like um, uh, like this, and she'd give an example. But so I asked her, and, and I sat down with with Kago, and we went through the titles, and, and also really unusual titles, the titles, and then what was in each thing, and we were just like, wow! And we went through the whole book. Have you ever had that before? No. Doesn't that sound good? Oh yeah! And so we were both really excited about this. Yeah, I want to eat that too. And so um, I, um, starting uh, in August 1st, in earnest, I just, oh, I asked my assistant to um, record the book because um, I didn't want to miss anything. And August 1st, I started just madly transcribing, writing recipes um, uh, without um, no, no proportions yet. I was just, you know, the listing of the ingredients and the, and the general method. And I was going from the translation, I mean, from the recording on the, on, on the, one of my old phones. And then I was just getting a little bit 
bored with it, listening to the voice all the time, and so I just started reading. And, um, and that was a big takeaway for that, that, because all of the cool material is in out-of-print books. Japanese internet started, I mean, the use of the internet started very late. I, I, I got to say 10 years ago or something, where everybody's got, I mean, they had the phones, but where everybody's got a computer in their house. And so what you find on the Japanese internet, by and large, is Cookpad, which is the worst recipes. They're so horrible. I mean, English type Cookpad is probably a little bit better. Um, maybe they curate it, I don't know. But the most, I, I, I've looked before for something, and the, the most astounding mismatch and mismatched um, ingredients, they're just like, I've never seen a set of worse, material, worse ingredients. Um, but I did meet the guy at one of the Stanford classes. He was super nice. So I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think that people like to eat like that. You know, it's just, it's not my thing. I was looking for, you know, authentic but interesting recipes. So I already wrote two books, and so I didn't want to re repeat. And um, so um, I um, mainly, or uh, um, a large portion of the material in this book was from Kaguchi-san. That was sort of the identifying, or the, the, the um, unifying force of the book. And then uh, one of the first places I had gone on my um, research trips was to Iwate. Um, there's a really uh, cool chef. He does French, Frenchy food. Um, he, um, but he, he came from another prefecture. His wife's from that, that area, and he just is so amazingly. He moved up to this little town that it was hit by the tsunami, and he took over. That he redid the school food program. He's promoting, like the the fisherman ladies' seafood uh, seaweed, and they sent me some to to take on my tour, and, and I've done it before. And he's he's really helping out the local people, and I. That's the kind of people I want to write about, that kind of a chef or that kind of a artisan. And he also um, does this um, food, food gathering every March and August. I've gone a couple times in, in March. And, um, and the main cook is this woman named Teiko Watanabe, who I mortifyingly wrote as Taiko in the book. Uh, she luckily will never read it, but I will fix it. It's just, I don't know what was going on in my head. Um, but Teiko-san, she feels like she's six foot tall. I'm 5'6", she must be like 5'10", which is really unusual. And she's 80, but she must be 85 now. And she's a very powerful uh, and um, but gentle woman, and she's very, her, as a person, she really attracted me, as, and so, and her food was not necessarily my type of food, but this is not supposed to be Nancy Hachisu book. You know, I wanted to get food that was delicious, but not my food. That I was filming her on my different devices, and photographing, and recording, and noting, 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 and um, then I had all this material. I have like, so many notebooks of material, um, but then, oh! <laughs> I have this collection of Japanese cookbooks and I have and of Japanese Japanese and then Japanese in English and then uh, Japanese people in English and then foreigners like me, uh, like you, um, in, Eng in English, uh, all of sort of um, from the 80s, you know. And um, one of the books, and then Andrew by then was working for me, um, and uh, so my second son. So I, I said, okay, and he's. He comes to work at 8 o'clock, and he drinks coffee for two hours. It's like, he needs a job. OK, so Andrew, please check these books and see which ones looks delicious. And, uh, but he's good with the kids, and he's a good cook. So um, he, he, oh, this is shit. No, 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 no. And then finally, he finds one book. And it was the one book that I thought was good, too. And we, and Teiko Watanabe's spelling, uh, Japanese spelling of her name is not self, it's not, self-evident. And so my uh, assistant said it was uh, Watabe and a, another's first name. And then, but eventually figured out, oh, that book that I really like is Teiko Watabe's book. So 
call her up through somebody else and get the okay. Can I, um, can I use some of the recipes and maybe fresh them up and maybe desugarize them and use meeting or less sweet? And, um, and she said, sure. And so um, those two powerful, beautiful women are, um, made this book what it is. And then I filled out with um, other material that I had looked at it f to think to possibly include in the other books. And at the time, I mean, these are sort of dated, super dated cookbooks. But looking through different eyes, looking through the eyes of 70s, 80s, and a whole different style of food than I had been making and channeling, I, s I could re-see, ah, this looks interesting. And if we just sort of fix it up a little bit, it'll be super good for the book. And so um, that's how it all emerged. Fiden, you know, they say it's the Bible series, which is a ridiculous, I <laughs> ridiculous idea in that you, it's so hard to count them. <laughs> They're going to see this. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's a great series. Um, no, it's, it's so hard to capture the whole cuisine of a country in 400 recipes. I had 350 as the minimum. And I, um, I was personally capping it at 400. It was, as it was, it was madness. I mean, if you can imagine testing recipes, 400 recipes in the space of April, May, no, May June, July, August, four months. Um, I, I almost like hated it. You know, it was just so much. Um, but the little preschoolers enjoyed the testing. I would say, who wants taste? And then run, 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 run. And they would, they loved everything. And the grandmas and grandpas uh, who came to pick them up loved everything. And so I thought, you know, and my assistant who's 50-ish, I don't know, um, she said it tasted, I mean, it was, she kept saying it was so beautiful tasting. Um, and, um, and that was how she liked to eat. She's not a very good, <laughs> she <she's, laughs> she's, doesn't cook that much. And so, um, but she likes that. And there's a feeling of, there's some shojin roots in it, the, the temple, uh, because actually that's how Japan was cooking. You know, That's the history of Japanese food. And so um, it makes a lot of sense. Plenty of meat and fish, too. Uh, there's a lot of sesame. And there's this amazing sesame uh, roaster in o Osaka, Wada, uh, Wadaman. And um, he donated to me. He always donates to me sesame oil. Ses I mean. White, gold, black, um, it's that the sesame production in Japan is totally, totally gone because it's outsourced to China. But <clears throat> so he buys his sesame as contract farmers for three different countries. But it's in the roasting. I mean, of course, the farm is an important part. But the, the roastery is where the sesame, just like coffee, it becomes transformed into this beautiful product. Prop product. And some of the places that I've been doing uh, pop-ups, I mean, the, the sesame that's in other kitchens is most likely rancid, and it's just horrible. So uh, the Japanese pantry has it, and they also donated a bunch of stuff. But um, the sesame was life changing, and the the, the ume, and um, so this book. Um, okay, it's in the Bible series, but it really is a moment in time in Japan, and for that way, it makes sense. And for me. Um, that was a great moment in time because it was sort of bubble years of Japan. It was after the 50s, 60s, because the war really decimated the food situation, and people were just scrambling. And finally, food was coming into Japan, and there was a prosperity. And so that was a time. And it's not farm food per se. I mean, no, it's not farm food. Um, it's maybe more town food or some um, uh, seaside food, but. Um, I think it's really um, exciting and cool food and um, made me re-excited about Japanese food. So um, I stand behind it. So um, that's all I've got right now. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask. But I need some water. So you talked a little bit about your kind of creative process uh, and the, 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 at the, the point where um, everything kind of came together and took on its own creative force and mm -hmm. just became the book. Um, how, 
how much do you think, uh, I mean, either tracing back to your, your visits to build those relationships, did you feel like uh, those those visits to, to build those relationships and those, uh, those follow-up visits, did it actually shape this whole creative process later on when it actually did take on its own force? Uh, yes and no. I mean, that most of that material um, is going into another book um, because of the photos. Um, but there's never, I mean, it's, it's always, you always are getting something um, by, from those visits and those relationships. They, um, they deepened my understanding or feeling of the ingredients and, um, but here, um, this ended up to be more research oriented, which I think a lot of the country books are, you know, because the authors have to pay for their travel. But I did, I don't ever regret the, the money spent on creating relationships because those are, are continuing and, and, um, um, and I've been introducing those people to other, other people. Like, this is this amazing potato flour that they are making in that town that has 3,000 people and it was hit by this tsunami. I think there's one guy in Japan making this. And I don't like to tell too many people about it. And I guess I shouldn't say it on this <laughs> venue, but it's like this flour. And I did it at a dinner in, in San Francisco. I used it at a dinner in San Francisco, and everybody went like crazy for it. It's a flour made from potatoes and this ma amazing process and of uh, drying them outside and and uh, you can use it for my chef friend in the local area they make a little uh, little manju or a little, little dongo like, and they're not so delicious or interesting they're little flower balls <laughs> but he used it to make bechamel and it was almost like a um, butterless bechamel and it doesn't goop up and it was the most and it makes a, a seafood stew with it. And I was at dinner in um, State Bird one day, and uh, Stuart Brioza said, we're, I was telling Stuart about it, and then he said, oh, I was in, the, I was in Peru, and they, they make the same thing. And, the, and, and they do it in the Andes, and they make a, a chicken stew with that. You know? And so I, I'm still trying to, I, I don't want to share that yet, but I, I'll share it in the next book, but I, it was going to be in this book. And so there's a lot of kind of, um, it's not, not it. What shaped it? I always thought I was going to shape, separate it by zenzai, namamo, and all the, the food, uh, the parts of the, the classic Japanese meal, and not by regionality. Um, but I also because of I wrote a section on history, um, because I I the hom Japan has got a lot of homogeneity nowadays, and a lot of the food here is coming from. I mean, for all over Japan, but it's, it was very difficult to separate. But um, the history is pretty amazing in that there's these food cultures and uh, like the method of making um, rice, not rice cooker rice, but re real rice in a pot, <clears throat> and glutinous rice that's been around for hundreds, if not a thousand years, the same way. And this is, I think, for if, if you are American, this is an astounding idea because we have such a young country. And so that's, and, um, but sorry, I got off track. <laughs> yeah. So the shaping took through the other, it became a much better book because of the issue about the, the no photos. So it took shape for different reasons, as it should have. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you can talk a bit more about your first book and, and just what was the process for you um, getting a publisher and just even <coughs> getting into the cookbook writing industry in the first place? Um, well, I got involved, I started probably 10 years before that. I got involved in slow food for myself, but also I, I specifically wanted to get, I live in a little town and 15,000 people, it's not so little, but in Japan, and I wanted to get, spend get more into the, into the world of food and through that process. Uh, and every time I went out to dinner um, in, in, in Italy or France, I'd hand my card to the, at that time it was my slow food card. And you know, we're really into cars. And so I just you know, carted people up everywhere. 
And um, then it so, sort of went along that um, um, uh, I became friends with some people at Chez Panisse, and that, you know, there was, sorry, we started this exchange with a soba chef friend going to do dinners at Chez Panisse, and then it was through Soul Food that I started writing. <clears throat> and because we did a soba dinner, and um, I told my slow food friends, do you guys want to write an article about this? And they said, yeah, well, we can't afford a, a, a uh, we're going to send the photographer and the editor, uh, but we can't afford a writer, so can you write it? And so I wrote this long thing, which was way too, too long. And in the process, uh, I realized, and then I handed it off, and, <clears throat> and I also wrote about the edible school, and I realized that they were just going to, like, it's just a pain to, to translate verbatim, to actually do a good translation. So my editor friend just read what I wrote, took all of my ideas, and wrote his own thing in Japanese. Like, well, that's no fun. You know, like, after all you work. And so I, that's when I started, OK. I knew it was way too long. I knew it wasn't the right format. And so I started doing the online classes uh, through Stanford. And um, then uh, somebody said, start a blog. And so some of those stories um, in Japanese farm food were Already had I'd written on a blog, and then the blog camp, and then uh, Michael Ruhlman, who's a um, very prolific author, he suggested I get involved in this IACP, and then I took my son to Portland. We went there, and he, he ended up in school in Portland. And, and I just sort of, and I went to this, I put myself in the position of being in sessions where there was an agent, and I just asked you know, the pointed questions that we learn how to do in high school and college to say, look at me, aren't I so smart? You know, so uh, I would like drop the Chez Panisse thing and the, and the, and the uh, living in Japan thing. And so she contacted me and said, you know, what are these ideas you have? And, and of course, like card, card, card. <clears throat> and um, uh, it's too bad that the cards are going on the wayside these, with uh, non-Japanese countries, but I got some cars with me if you want. <laughs> but, um, but one of the boxes was for a chiro chiropractor. <laughs> it was like they sent me two boxes, the one's wrong. But um, anyway, <laughs> I just opened it today. But um, I just, and then I wrote a proposal. Um, and actually, Andrews McMeal was the, every, got lots of passes. Um, and, and, then, and then Andrews McMeal um, accepted it and then, um, that's what the way it was, but you got to write a proposal for. Okay, what is Chez Panisse? Chez Panisse, uh, it's a restaurant in Berkeley. Oh. Uh, kind of probably the, the 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 mother of farm to table. One of the things I find very interesting is you have a foot both in the sort of Northern California food scene and the Japanese food scene, mm -hmm. and you mentioned your <coughs> you know your your roots in the slow food movement and the farm to table movement. That's obviously very big in Northern California and kind of as a response to the you know, industrial food system. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how Japanese culture approaches food and what the difference are, is, are you see between the way Japanese approach food and the way you see it in, in say, Northern California? Well, you know, I'm not the uh, know-all for Japan. I, I have my take, but we're still, there's research, so, Japanese are very accepting of the poor ingredients, uh, even mothers. Like, they don't read the back of what's in the label. And if somebody made it for us, it must be good, is a really big uh, overall feeling. And I, again, I don't want to be madly generalizing, but um, I do have a little preschool, and I have lived there for 30 years, and this has been a huge experience that even, and you know, strawberries are sprayed with chemicals 30 times and they're still giving it to the kids. I mean, I finally had to say, it was, occasionally we have bento in our school, um, mostly I cook, and uh, I just finally just told, could you just please don't give those strawberries to your kids, you know, but um, <clears throat> the, you know, like all over the world, people are cooking less. In Japan, they went from big farm kitchens to this, you know, crappy little strip in the, you know, some corner of the house, um, and um, there's no room. There's, you know, there's. It's just, it's, it's a lot harder to cook. Um, it's harder to buy the materials. Um, I ask people all the time. We have a local soy sauce 
And miso place that also makes tofu and tofu-related products and, you know, natto and some of the age. And I ask whenever some media comes, and I always ask them, so on your way home from work, can you get good natto or can you get good tofu? And these are sort of the, the instant foods of Japan. And we, I use them at the school when I have nothing else to cook except for dried pasta, which I hate. You know, then I can do a tofu lunch thing, you know. And, um, but they don't have access to good ones because, you know, it's, those kind of things are, are less and less. But it's resurging. And that is thanks to, okay, the hippie movement. <laughs> and then also from you guys, actually. It's a great thing about Japan. They look to the other countries and they see, you know, and it's the reverse importation or exportation. I can never remember which is the correct word. But, um, and that's, and then long-term foreigners. Why am I on TV? It's not because I'm so scintillating. It's because I have been there a long time. I make my own miso. I do these things. I live in an old house, but also, you know, I can say, Hey, this scotch piece is so amazing, and this, this, and so it's like this. Oh, yeah, maybe it is cool, and they just never thought about it. Like most people don't even know the difference between kikoman and our soy sauce yamaki jozo. They don't know that it's made with Chinese, you know, non-organic beans, and this one over here is Japanese organic with um, it's aged in cedar barrels for a year and a half, and this has been made in a, you know, or actually these are not even kikoman, the the, the cheap stuffs made from, from soybean grits, not even beans, you know. So people just don't know that. Even TV directors come and I take them to Yamaki and they don't even know the difference between miso and soy sauce. And so it's just like, um, it's starting. And it really helps. Everything that you guys do comes back. So it really helps that the whole world is foodifying, you know. And so the bad thing that happens in Japan, unfortunately, is, you know, everybody seems like they're obsessive about food like watching or the TV or, or the, I mean, I don't know how many people still watch TV, but still a lot of people. But what happens is I think they get um, uh, intimidated. I mean, the Katsubushi guy told me six years ago that 60% of the people who make dashi, which is this simple, you know, kelp and dried fish thing, broth, not like chicken stock that takes an hour and a half or two hours, and, um, and bones. And 60% of the people actually make it use powdered. And I think that's because it's not the convenience thing. I think it's from intimidation of, oh, there's this Kyoto chef, and he's using magurabushi, and he's doing this and this and this. It's the most amazing dashi in the whole world. I can't make that, so I better just get powdered. I, I feel like it's like that. And so you know, there's that perfection, having to have perfection. And so you know, know my, my rolled egg omelet is not as beautiful as my husband's, and I can live with that. But it's delicious because we have good eggs and good soy sauce and good meeting and you know that's you have to forgive yourself I think. Um, I know you're doing some collaborative dinners. You've already done some. And yeah. You're going to. Um, I think that's that's very exciting for me because I'd like to attend and go. Uh -huh. What's it like for you? Because these are um, you know chefs in restaurants, and you know this is I mean what's it like for you to do a collaborative dinner? Everyone's different, um, and it starts with the approach. Mostly, <clears throat> nobody says no because um, they, um, it, surprisingly, um, maybe because it was such a direct approach, the Japanese farm food and also the preserving book are both um, really popular with a lot of chefs. And um, I um, write the menu or don't write the menu. It all, I sort of feel my way through with each different chef. Um, and some of them I know, especially first time. Um, and then sometimes it, and they're busy. And uh, actually, this tour, I ended up writing a lot of the menu because um, there's 400. I kept whittling it down. OK, here's my top 100. Here's my top 50. You know, and then, OK, can you just write the menu, Nancy? OK. Um, but <laughs> some, of them, <laughs> yeah, some of them are, are, are part of the menu. And then there, there's all kinds of things. Some of them. I'm in the kitchen all day, some of them are not, and I just sort of feel my way. Um, and um, it's harder for the first time collabos, you know. Um, I bring all of the materials, and so uh, this time I could only bring 50 kilos. Um, that was sort of my max max. And then I asked, and Hodo Soy um, has, I got hooked up with um, their sales guy in Natural Expo 
last year, a year and a half ago, and I just thought he was, he didn't know anything about my books, but some of his people were big fans, but he, he was just a fun guy. He's like this six foot tall, um, wearing shorts, um, ponytail guy. And um, so I just loved him, and so I really wanted to be, uh, I want, really wanted to promote Hodo because they're local, and, this, and I had to get over the fact that it's not Japanese tofu. And so he gave me Yuba and, I, you know, and to taste, and, and then when I came back last fall, he gave me um, so, soy milk, and, and, and he sent it, to, and medium tofu, and, and I found a way, like the medium tofu for Hodo, because they don't use um, a nigiri, uh, nigari, they use uh, a Chinese uh, uh, sodium chloride or something, some of their harder, so the tofu is harder, but if you put it, it's great for chefs, if you put it in the robocoop and you don't have to press it, then the flavor is good. And so, anyway, um, and then this, the Japanese pantry guys donated. So it's all about the materials, and I don't want to have a, a, a discussion. I, 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 want, I only collaborate with people who have the same ideas as I do, and so I typically don't collaborate with Japanese restaurants um, because they're using, they're used to, a, they have a budget and they're using less than. And so here I just bring it all and say, let's use this, and I give them their budget, and that's it. I mean, their budgeted amount of stuff. <clears throat> so, um, and there was one other thing I forgot. Oh, I'll be, I'll be chef at residence at Scribe over Labor Day weekend. Come, come, come. I was going to do it uh, last October, but because of the fires, we canceled. So, um, you guys look like Scribe people, right? No? <laughs> All the beautiful people. <laughs> I'm going to be one, too. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I think all the collabos in the Bay Area are over. I'm going to be an omnivore. But you don't want to, you'll, you'll just hear the same thing. <laughs> Not really. But um, going to New York. All right. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you.